Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice lunch. Like I mentioned before the break, we have one final episode, Human Zero Infinite. We'll be seeing four innovations and hearing from a number of special guests, including famous ballet dancer Marie-Claude Pietragala. But before we do, we are talking to a former ambassador of the Singularity University. He came all the way from Washington, D.C. to talk to us about what actually is the Singularity University and why he's no longer ambassador. So please join me in welcoming Zach Alal. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, Zach. Um, I hope you're not too jet lagged. No, I'm fine. So okay. far, so good. Good. Um, let's just to clear sort of up any questions it is, what is the Singularity University? What is its mission? So the, the Singularity University is a think tank as well as a center, education center that's based in Silicon Valley, in Mountain View, um, right at the heart of NASA uh, and also the NASA Research Center as well as in, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Its mission is to educate people, the next generation leaders, uh, as well as decision makers on the impact, uh, the societal impact, the political impact, the economic impact of what they call um, exponential technologies, AI, neurosciences, biotechnology, nanotechnology, robotics, etc. You mentioned a tagline about affecting a billion people. Is that sort of their limit of, of where they come into play? Well, it, it's, it's what, what you are taught when you are at the heart of Silicon Valley and also at, at Singularity University is this exponential thinking mindset. Okay. It's the idea that you can, one technology that has kind of a snowball effect can affect a one person, two persons, four persons, eight persons, etc. So the idea of its founders, Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis, is to actually impact a billion people in the next 10 years by having a technology that say, for example, a drone that improves access to some rural areas that delivers vaccines to some remote areas uh, in Africa, for example. There's this also this idea of the rising billion, the fact that people in Africa are going to have access to smartphones. The Maasai today has access to information on his smartphone, uh, more has access to more information than the President of the United States 30 years ago. So this is kind of the mindset that you are taught uh, at Singularity University. And so you became an ambassador. Can you tell us sort of what attracted you to SU and also what was your role as an ambassador? When I first joined Singularity University in 2011, uh, I joined it as a med student. At the time, I was very, very uh, enthusiastic about the idea of technologies, especially medical technologies when I was a medical student, and how medical technologies were going actually to impact a billion people. I was a lot into biotechnologies, medical devices, etc. I uh, grew kind of within this community, went up the ladder, becoming a teaching fellow, as well as, a, uh, as somebody who started his own company doing uh, medical devices uh, for uh, transplantation. And my startup was based right there. Um, and at the time, I was, it was 2014, so I started, I'm, I'm originally from North Africa, from Algeria. And I'm Francophone, I'm in love with France, I love Paris, I, I love French-speaking uh, countries. And I was thinking, there's nothing really going on at the time. It was quite, very quiet uh, when it came to exponential technologies. We're talking about 2014. Um, and I decided, why not doing something that could even have, in my exponential thinking, I could actually help to import Singularity University in Paris and eventually also go to Africa because you have a huge number of French-speaking countries uh, in Africa. Being African, I thought that was a great idea to be the ambassador of the Singularity University's French-speaking countries. And um, so yes, this was kind of like the mindset in 2014. 2015, when I was here, we set a, a, a couple of partnerships with big uh, CAC 14 CAC 40 companies. Um, and at the time, I was on stage with a, with a minister and I said it explicitly, the next president of France is going to encourage startups, entrepreneurs, and youth leadership. And that's exactly what is happening. 
at that time, so in 2015, was that shocking? Was that sort of like a revolutionary statement for them? I think it was, it was very uh, disrupting. Uh, I could see some cultural clashes, but I think being uh, originally from Algeria, having lived in France, knowing the culture, I saw myself as an ambassador, as somebody who was building the bridge between uh, France and Silicon Valley, France and the United States. And um, I, it, was, it was very hard to do. Uh, obviously, any intercultural uh, job is very hard. Any diplomat could tell you this. It's, it's very hard to build bridges. But it was, uh, it, it was uh, ultimately done, and I think it was, it was a, a big success. So, as I understand it today, you, did not, you decided to not continue to be an ambassador for the Singularity University. Correct. Why is that? It sounded so, so great. I think, I think it's a great place. Singularity Uni University was uh, and continues to be a great place when it comes to uh, trying to get yourself into this mentality of impacting a billion people in the next 10 years. And that was the reason why I got so heavily involved. However, I think there is a cultural component that is very important, especially around California and uh, in general in the West Coast, where a lot of people tend to be very idealist. They tend to have moonshot thinking, which is great when you want to have breakthrough innovation. When Sorry, you want... what is moonshot thinking? So moonshot thinking is, for example, having an idea, no limits, when you want to say, I want to start a company that wants to do asteroid mining. I want to send a robot that goes to space and mine an asteroid. My company, my startup, had the moonshot thinking of say, we want to tackle the problem of organ donation shortage. So there is not enough organs that exist for people to receive as an organ. We want to find a technology that will enable us to store those organs so that we can actually implant them. We want to completely disrupt the market. Okay. This is exponential thinking. Another, this is disruptive thinking. Another moonshot thinking is to say, I want to send um, a, a spaceship space to space and have it come back. This is also moonshot okay. thinking. Um, so I think it's great. I think moonshot thinking is great. However, I think also that it is important to focus on the present moment, on what is happening right here, right now, all over the world. And I realize that you have to be a realist also. You have to look at what is happening all over the world and the consequences of those exponential technologies, especially when it comes to information. We're living in an era where news is everywhere. It's literally inside our bed. We go to sleep and we check the Twitter feed. So I think this is impacting our lives. It has disrupted and shifted elections. It is right now um, shifting geopolitical events around the world. And that was the main reason why I decided to pivot from or to move from Silicon Valley to Washington DC at the Institute of World Politics which is a, a great institute, a grad, uh, an institute that focuses on national security, geopolitics, mm -hmm. international affairs. Um, and today what I'm doing is to focus on the uh, geopolitical social impact of those disruptive technologies in the field. Okay. Um, and I mean, Singularity University is hyper-mediatized, so it's, 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 and I think it's also an interesting experience to shift from a hyper-mediatized world towards a world where you're working with what I call silent professionals, people who uh, shape our lives inside offices. They make very important decisions um, in the shadows, and I, and I think it's also a great opportunity to work in, 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 in the shadows behind the scenes. So I want to get into some examples of, of what you're working on now, but just to take a step back, how do you think technology is impacting politics and world affairs today? I think the, the, you have a different spectrum. Uh, I, I like to use the acronym of the mnemonic DIME, Diplomacy, Information, Military, and Economy. I will cite probably one example, um, information. We're living now in an age where uh, probably, just to give you an example of how powerful the information we have access to today, 80% of the information that is openly available is just refurbished 
and classified. So say the uh, secret agencies we hear about, the, uh, the uh, intelligence agencies, now focus mo more on what we call open intelligence. 80% of the information is out there available to people. We are experiencing a tsunami of information. Um, and information today can be true and it can be also fake. And I think fake news today, and, and, I, and I know it's been a buzzword in the recent weeks, have been shifting geopolitical events and have been shifting fates of states. And we all have seen how it happened in the US elections um, and the role of social media, which are a channel that spread these informations, has been um, increasing, uh, their role has been increasing. Um, so today I think um, there is, this is a, a, a clear example of how social media technologies are shaping our perception, are shifting geopolitical events. And didn't it have an effect on the French uh, presidential election too? We talked a little bit about hacking and, and sort of the, the backlash of that um, on the phone when we, were, when we were talking about this. And I thought it was really interesting to think about Macron and, and sort of the experiences of, of what just happened here in France. I, th I, think, I think there is a, France was a very uh, good example. I saw how Macron uh, was able to uh, dodge the effect of how your server has been hacked, how some information can be leaked. Um, I think Macron was able to understand very quickly and efficiently that an information leak sometimes can be very damaging and it depends on how your political advisors and how your communications team is able to, uh, to address that. Um, uh, as opposed to in the United States where actually was amplified. I think today we're living in an era of information warfare, what I would call it, and it's, it's, it's a term that is kind of uh, a little bit uh, offensive, but it's the times that we're living in. And if you have good advisors who are able to handle this information warfare by either managing a leak, by either being going more offensive and flooding the space, the informational space by more information, uh, is the best way to do it today. That's the era in which we are living. So, can maybe you give us some examples of things that you're working on? Because I think the, when you highlight the offenses, right, fake news, I think everybody can kind of understand, but what is there to be done? Or what are you doing today to sort of combat that? So, as, as an example of a research project that I've uh, been working recently, which I thought was fascinating, and, and, and how it is interpreted across different countries, um, We've been seeing recently the use of uh, independent actors uh, or terrorist organizations who have been using uh, synthetic biology, synth biology knowledge in order to make bio bi biological weapons, in order to make bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics, in order to spread disease. This is something that could be, that, that, that has the potential to have, that has the potential to be, to have a huge, um, uh, epidemiological and global health effects. What I found interesting was the way those scientific findings on how to make a bacteria resistant, etc., were published and publicized. The way they are spread in the scientific community. For example, in the US, people usually tend to share those findings and they don't see it as an information, even if it's what we call dual usage knowledge, an information that can be used for good purposes or bad purposes. There is not a tendency to self-censorship. To self you don't want to censor this information. We did a kind of a comparative study here in France, and we've been able to see that here in France, for example, um, there have been some recommendations where they don't actually want to publish those findings. There is a tendency to have to be more, uh, to have this self-censorship. And I found it very interesting because the more you talk about it, the more you're creating public hysteria. And, and I think this is exactly the effect of what terrorist organizations are looking to, to, to do, to provoke. They, are, they want 
to create public hysteria. Now it doesn't take me to uh, send someone and do harm to other people. All what I want to do is to have a PR manager who is going to make you believe that a terrorist organization is able to create uh, a uh, bacteria that is resistant and make everybody be really afraid about it and, and create this hy hysteria. While the French recommendation was like, let's not talk about it, let's censor, let's censor it, let's not publicize it. And in that specific case, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, and that raises the question, of course, of scientific publications versus censorship, which I find a fascinating debate as well. So this is the kind of projects that I work on uh, at, at the right moment um, amongst all the, du the dual use of, uh, of technologies. And so you're working with sort of these silent, what do you call them, silent world shapers, these people who are sort of in the shadows and, and underground. What is your relationship with them? Are they receptive to these types of information? Do they feel completely behind? Par you know, when we look at the technology advances, like how are they supposed to flood Facebook suddenly with their own information, right? Like how are they reacting to what you're doing? I, th I think they are very receptive, at least in the United States. I think there is a, um, there are big major efforts to try to address the issue of fake news, for example, and other issues. And I think also that there are, there, there is a huge, um, uh, economic potential and huge, huge business, business opportunities for other companies that help the government manage this kind of, of uh, information flood. There are companies who try to curate information on Facebook, there are companies who work with decision makers, um, including either at the White House and some other federal uh, agencies, which, which I personally find fascinating. When you see someone like Zuckerberg realize that after two years he's made mistakes um, and he's able to have his teams, the private sector, all kind of sit with the decision makers, either executive or other branches of the government sit and discuss about those impacts and are willing to collaborate, I think we're moving in the right path. Mm -hmm. And I think those people are, are doing a great job. I think they are. Um, they are the great people who are keeping these words uh, safe so far. So. So that brings up an interesting point, just on a personal level, do you think that these new media outlets, Twitter and Facebook and, and other media outlets, have a responsibility to censor? I, I think they have a responsibility to let the people decide the kind of content that they have access to. And the decision of Facebook, for example, to allow you to flag a content based on uh, whether you think it's uh, credible or not, if the source is good or not, I think it's already a good first step. Uh, I do believe that Facebook is a channel of information. It doesn't have the responsibility to censor. It is the readers who give credibility. And I think it's even better because you are creating kind of a territory of places where, let's say in France, what people in France consider as credible content not, uh, not uh, vulgar content, not offensive content, maybe vulgar and offensive in some other cultures. So the fact that Facebook uh, allows local people to rate the source and the credibility of the information is actually contributing to the global mission of Facebook, which is allowing people to decide for themselves and empowering them. And ultimately, I think it's an empowerment of democracy. Well, thank you so much. This has been a great talk. I hope that you'll stick around a little bit so that you can chat with some people afterwards. At this time, I would like to welcome you. We're going to thank Zach for all of um, that he shared, and we're going to check out the video for um, Human Zero Infinite. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.